How's everyone Hi. tonight? Hi. Yes, thank you. Thank Ooh. you. Uh, we're so grateful that you're with us tonight, and thank you for just being helping us ease into this evening. I think we've all had really long weeks, and uh, probably you all have as well. So we're just going to keep this super chill, have a really nice conversation for about 45 minutes. Um, as you can see, we are filming this, um, and we hope to be able to share it uh, widely as well uh, once we kind of get the recording going. Um, so welcome. Welcome to the Brown Arts Institute, to Granoff. Um, I'm Avery Willis Hoffman. I am the artistic director of the BAI. I'm also a professor of the practice of arts and classics. Um, and so I'm really, uh, really happy to see some of my um, TAPS friends here tonight and some of my classics colleagues as well. So thank you for, for being here. Um, so I wanted to just um, give a little tiny bit of an intro to kind of set a framework for why we're here and gathered to, today. Um, and then we're just gonna get into some conversation um, and we will sort of go with the flow for about 45 minutes um, and then take a little break and invite you all to join us for some cupcakes. It feels like today's the day that we need cupcakes. <laughs> Um, and please feel free to, to ask any of us questions or, or be in community with us around cupcakes because that's really important. <laughs> um, so welcome. Um, this uh, conversation has, I feel like, been brewing actually a really long time. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. I have a PhD in classics from Oxford, and my uh, journey through that PhD was really focused around Euripides' Trojan women. Um, and I had done my, my bachelor's degree in classics and English literature, and my master's degree in classics, and had really um, spent a lot of time thinking about Greek tragedy and Shakespeare, um, and also just um, modern art interpretations of those works. Um, and so my thesis on Trojan women, I spent a good five, six years really digging into modern um, interpretations of Trojan women, um, and then had the great pleasure of um, not only studying the text in its original um, language in ancient Greek, translating it into a poetic translation, um, and then directing that translation at the Oxford Playhouse in Oxford, um, which was a great joy um, in many, many respects. And part of it was, um, I don't know if you all remember, this is a long time ago now, 2004, um, Abu Ghraib was exposed. Um, and so part of my interpretation of Trojan Women then was through the lens of Abu Ghraib. Um, and any of you who know that show, you can imagine the the kind of um, the ways in which you could bend that show to respond to the Abu Ghraib um, atrocities that were uncovered. Mm -hmm. um, so my journey through that kind of scholarly exercise of research and then sort of um, developing that research um, sort of uh, exploration into a, a performance was really very rich and my aha moment of like, this is really what I wanna, wanna do. Um, so fast forward, here we are at Brown um, and last year, my thesis advisor from, from the early 2000s in Oxford called me and said there's a, a pair of amazing young Oxford students who are working on Medea. And they are doing a BIPOC version of Medea. Their entire cast is BIPOC. Their entire staff is BIPOC. And everyone working on this production. And they would love your support. They would love to hear from you and hear about your time you know, interpreting um, the classics and uh, reimagining the classics. Um, would you have a chat with them? Um, and so I did, and that resulted in what became a kind of nationwide tour of their version of Medea in a kind of um, film, short film version because of the pandemic, they were not able to rehearse. Um, and so um, we kind of started this interrogating the classics idea around some of the conversations we were having with them and that kind of lens into the classical world. Why do we do the classics? Why, why do we even think about them? Why do we still research them? Why do we still study them? Why do we still interpret them? Oops, excuse me. So all to say, um, here we are. Um, during that period of time, Professor Bonnie Honig um, came to me and said, hey, guess what? There's this incredible show that's been developing called Our Country. 
It is uh, very much um, influenced and inspired by Bonnie's book on Antigone. Um, you know, how about bringing them to Brown and see, um, see what we might help them with, how we might help them develop. So here we are today. Um, our country has been rehearsing this week upstairs. Um, Bonnie's class has had a wonderful opportunity to meet um, both Becca and Annie. Um, and so we wanted to take this moment to sort of gather and gather some other friends from across campus and Providence. Um, so Shay is with us and Rachel as well, um, to just sort of have a little conversation about what it means to tackle the classics uh, in 2022. So I will stop talking there, and um, I really want to allow each of you to introduce yourselves um, and talk about your work, your background, anything that might be helpful for all of us to think about, um, and maybe we'll start with Annie. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie. Um, I'm Annie Saunders. This is Becca Wolf, my creative partner on Our Country, which has, um, as Avery mentioned, been here at BAI. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and we have had a long week. We have been working all week, so we're gonna, I'm going to try to be as coherent here as possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, just want to say thank you so much to Bonnie and to Jessica and the folks at BAI for having us. And thank you also both Rachel and Shay for being here to mm. talk with us and, and everyone else that's here. Um, what's important for people to know? Mm. Is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> that could be a question, sure. Yeah. What feels what's important? important? What's important? That was what I caught. <laughs> <laughs> what's important for people to know yes. going into this like conversation mm. with us? Um, well, uh, our country is an adaptation um, of Antigone or an interpretation or a response, I suppose, to to Antigone that Becca and I, um, the conversation between us began in, in 2014 and we started developing the show. And as we said when we visited Bonnie's class the other day, like we've been developing it and creating it and iterating it in, in sort of full productions and residency productions and various types of iterations since then. But you know, that's a lot of years, but we've probably worked on the show for like two or three weeks a year <laughs> in those years. Um, so uh, we, and, and then of course, like everyone, we had a long pause in the last couple of years in the, in the touring and development and growth of the show. Um, so we've been coming back to it this week and, um, and yeah, sort of similar to this conversation, like feeling what the context means now um, to us personally and, and, and also in bringing it back to, to an audience or again to an audience. Um, so it's an adaptation and an interpretation and a response to Antigone um, and in very much in particular the kind of brother-sister relationship in that story and the question of, of right and wrong and how that relates to um, legality and rules and regulations. Um, mm. And it also has a great deal of autobiographical material of mine, so I perform in the show and the, sh the, it, the show is devised by Becca and myself, but also by all of the designers. Um, and there's another performer, um, oh, there's a previous performer who devised a lot of material and a current performer who also devised a lot of material. So it's very much, I guess what's important, what feels important for folks to know is that, um, is that this show and my, my work in particular is sort of coming from a devised theater um, background. So things that are made by many voices in one room, um, performers, designers, creators, et cetera, of, of live performance. Um, and in the pandemic, and shortly before the pandemic, my work also has begun to extend to more things that look more like installations than performances mm -hmm. and some um, site-specific uh, sound art as well. Um, some of which is pandemic adaptation and some of which is because uh, all of my work has also kind of in, in addition to like a devised, devised theater context, like making it up rather than authoring it, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, it also has site specificity always at the core, so it's always like made for, for where it takes place um, or in response or adaptation or interpretation of, of the location where it is. Um, so I think that's enough things to say. Mm -hmm. Becca? 
Actually, sorry, Avery's calling on people. No, no, go for it, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Becca. I hear Becca's notes on what I just said. Mm -hmm. so sorry. Oh, what we've <laughs> I'm, I'm Becca Wolf, and as Annie said, <clears throat> co-creator of Our Country. Um, and when we came together for this collaboration, part of what interested us was that we're really coming from very different practices. So my practice has been much more um, with scripts, directing plays. Who does that anymore? <laughs> <laughs> but my, so my impulse with classics was always sort of deconstructive. It was like I would find something mm. that was difficult or objectionable and be like, ooh, yeah, something I can like, you know. <laughs> so I did like The Robbers by Schiller, mm. and I did it, um, uh, like it was a production of The Robbers, but it was, the lead was played um, by a very small female actor. <laughs> and that the, there's, if you know that play, there's the, the, there are these twins mm -hmm. that are sort of like the good and bad in this very um, German, Sturm und Drang um, uh, uh, epic. And uh, so for me, that was exciting to, to kind of push against these ideas that are in the play about kind of free, they're about, about freedom really and about like criminality, a lot of the same um, themes that are actually in our country, um, but to do it in a way that would have the audience be like, oh, that's not supposed to be like that. Mm -hmm. But what does that make me, how does that open this story up to me in some way? Um, so uh, this and then doing like Troilus and Cressida, but as a football game. You know, mm -hmm. kind of like seeing these characters as these like young kind of like, I grew up in a place where football was very important and, and it was like the kind of masculine um, identity that was born of that feels very much like I feel like what Shakespeare was saying about masculine identity born of a, a war that had no, no why, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was the kind of stuff that I was doing which, which um, at the time that Annie and I started working on our country, I was I I just was really interested in what you were doing and what, you know, this whole world of devising and making it up instead of either authoring it or responding to it or creating a response to for people, you know. So um, uh, that was where I was coming from and since then have done a little bit more of this work of, of assemblage and, and devising and that kind of thing. Beautiful, thank you. Rachel. Hi, everybody. <laughs> my, hi. hi. <laughs> um, my name is Rachel. <laughs> my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am an assistant professor of practice uh, at Brown Trinity MFA programs. I teach um, the actors and directors. I generally teach acting studios. Um, my main uh, focus is in solo performance and also um, uh, acting in the classics, which really I have now started to expand into just poetic, theatrical, heightened language, language that is actually outside of how we, uh, what we understand to be vernacular pedestrian speech. Um, so that is what I teach, I come from an acting background. I'm a New York based actor and I um, lovingly traveled to this beautiful hill to spend time with my MFA students and undergraduates. <laughs> um, I, um, I have a uh, classical background in the sense that I was a classics major Woo! in undergraduate and I was so desperate to get a PhD and I was like oh I, I don't know if my life will sustain that library time because I, I because I really like I was doing plays and a classics major and the plays went out the plays went out but um, I spent a lot of time um, translating Homeric poetry and also some dramatic um, some dramatic um, poetry plays, uh, Greek plays. And so I have um, not just familiarity, but like deep love of that language and also how um, we bring those stories into our creative spaces um, with ownership and agency. So that um, is how I hold space um, with all of you and also um, in this uh, program and institution. Yes. 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 Yes.
good, what is English? Good night, everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Shay Rivera Rios. I am born and raised in Boriquen, otherwise known as the settlement of Puerto Rico. Uh, born and raised over there, came here 12 years ago, rooted in the community, been doing work here with some really incredible people over the years, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist, so mostly focus on installation work and performance art, and that segued me into the wonderful world of theater, where I started to flex um, my muscles in building longer storylines versus like smaller skill vignettes. And what I'm interested in and what propels me to do this work, I really believe art is a powerful tool for social change. It can be wielded as a weapon, it can be wielded as medicine. And being from Boriquen, you know, this idea of like, what has colonization done to us? You know, what does liberation mean? Learning a lot from folks here in my circles and my networks. And I wanted to build out the play of Antigone mm -hmm. and reconfigure it. For a, long, for a long time, it was a haunting. Like I had to just get this out of my body. And during the pandemic, a lot of things happened you know, uprisings, the Trump era, all these things, and Boriquen standing up in liberation, you know, it just became the perfect moment to use Antigone as an avatar to unravel and try to tell this story. And we were talking a little bit about it, that creative process is like painful mm -hmm. and messy mm -hmm. and dirty and beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, having really great mentors that were helping me to develop this work in this theater called Double Edge Theater in Ashfield. Mm -hmm. They focus on spectacle theater, the very physical, very physical theater. So I spent mm -hmm. several residencies there throughout 2021 to develop this piece. Mm -hmm. um, and they just produced the Bacchae, mm -hmm. which was like incredible. So yes, I presented and I wrote Antigonix and presented it at the Wilbury Group here um, this year in March. And it had nine showings, and then we took it to Double Edge Theater for a festival as well. And I acted in the play, which was not the original idea, <laughs> but I ended up acting in it, and that was wild. So yes. I'll tell you more about that. <laughs> well, maybe Thank maybe you. we could keep going on that, Shay, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Tell us more about that that process. Why Antigone? Why you know? Just yeah. dig into that a little bit more, and then maybe. Please feel free to, to enter locateur. Right, yeah. That's not a word, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but years ago, I read La Pasión Según Antigona Pérez, uh, you know, written by a very important Afro-Boricua writer, and that was from the 70s. And this piece really spoke to me as a young person. You know, this idea of what does it mean to be a political agent in a time where corruption exists, right? So that story still haunted me. And several years ago, I did want to try to use it to just tell a new story. You know, I'm non-binary, they them pronouns. Um, I'm queer, you know, what does it mean to make this, the, remake the story from the perspective of, you know, looking at Antigone as a character that doesn't belong in either world where they exist. They are a duality and they are a plural. And then also, what does it mean to hold space for family? And I think at a moment where a lot of us were asking these questions of like, what does it mean to show up for this time? Mm -hmm. Like, where is our positionality in social justice and mm -hmm. like liberation work and struggle? Like, I felt like these two characters were not leaving me alone. You mm -hmm. know, one here being like, burn it all down. Like, you can't change the system. The other one being like, but you believe in community. We can do this together. We can work through it. And those two characters, you know, became embodied in Antigona and Ismene. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, it was a haunting and I had to use it. I had some questions around like why a Greek classic, mm -hmm. especially to tell a story that is actually about, you know, the re-indigenization of Puerto Rico led by black and brown women and trans and non-binary folks. But I just felt like the right container, mm -hmm. you know? I used it as a container to tell the story that I wanted to use. It felt like some of the language in there was really important. Like this idea of the, they both come a family that has privilege. Mm -hmm. What does it mean when we have privilege and we're questioning our roles in, in struggle? And how do we carry family trauma? You know, mm -hmm. each of us are like having these questions of transgenerational trauma of mm -hmm. family lineage. Mm -hmm. So that piece from the original Antigone, it just, there are so many questions there, you know? 
and also the character of Tiresias, which I thought was brilliant, because mm. in many cultures we have this, you know, creature, incredible teacher who holds ancestral knowledge and is the key for us to unlock, you know. Mm. So I really was fascinated with Tiresias. So the play ended up being just um, three characters and one key dancer that will hold space for a cockfight. I saw the brothers as roosters, and it was a cockfight. They killed each other. We're out there with masks. We do a dance. We die. And then Tiresias opens the world, and it says, welcome to the Center for Ancestral Technologies. We are going to conjure two ancestors that will speak to us today. So, you know, and it's like that piece, and I'll keep it a little short to, like, make more space. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'll, I'll receive that. Take your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate Take your that. Time. You have time. See, shedding the layers of colonization. Okay, <laughs> um, this is the culmination of a whole body of work. You know, like we think about creative practice, we don't throw things away. We just continue to build on work. So it was a big body of work that I was having these key questions about Puerto Rico, Borican, and what does liberation mean for us. And then, you know, it just became a longer story. It became a longer story to like answer those questions through embodiment, you know? Mm -hmm. So I lost my train of thought, but. No, that's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. I had a lot of questions and I put it all in that piece. Mm. Thank you, thank you. So Annie and Becca, I'm curious, you know, sort of, did you have a similar way into Antigone? Kind of speak to that a little bit and what are the things within the play or why that play um, tease that out a little bit perhaps um, yeah i mean we were saying when we were talking earlier about how many antigones there were this one year yeah. i live in san francisco mm -hmm. and there were four antigones which you know there's like four theaters in san francisco. <laughs> so wow. everybody had an antigone <laughs> And so, we, you know, it was something where, where it was like, why, why this story? Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was kind of, it was before Trump, so it wasn't like, you know, so clear that we were, you know, we, we had to get out there against the government so much, you know. We, I remember doomed. we didn't talk about it. There was, I was thinking about that, actually, it's so funny. I said, yeah. do you want to go first? And then I just interrupted you after 30 seconds. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> Bonnie. Um, uh, I remember us having this conversation about like what there are these, maybe there are these moments in time where everybody does Antigone, you know, like there's a lot of Antigones and one of them, I think in the, before we started talking about like, oh, probably when it feels like there's a totalitarian regime coming in, people start doing Antigone again. But even before that, we were talking about things that feel like so long ago, pre-Trump now, like Proposition 8 and mm. stuff, stuff where there's legislation coming into the domestic space. Like, mm -hmm. and also about surveillance. Mm -hmm. I remember we were yeah. just talking about like the internet and the visibility and the idea of like, when it feels like there's, maybe when there's a rise of a feeling of being, um, a dis dissolving of the line between public and private, that like the law is coming into the to the private space through visibility or for, forced visibility, or um, maybe that's when everybody starts doing Antigone again. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I think, and and I mean, something that I was thinking about as you were talking, Shay, was like that. There's this this question about um, like. Uh, where do we sit in these in in the struggle? You know, and this is de I mean, our our st story. It's a white story. You know, it's about mm -hmm. two members of a white family. Mm -hmm. And when we started doing that, I don't know that we were so conscious of the fact that that was the case. You know, mm -hmm. like I don't. You know, sorry to say. You know, we. I don't think that we. You know, there was. I don't think among between us there was like a strong consciousness of what we were doing. And then over these years, I feel like the, um, the question of how white liberals speak to their cousins, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like how do we bring, like basically how do we expand the reach of those kinds of awakenings or social justice or you know the, the kind of liberation or supportive liberation that, that 
that you know, we're busy learning, wanting to learn to do, and then we have our friends, <laughs> family members, who maybe are not so on board. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting. In, in Annie's, it's not as if this is a story about like a Trump supporter and not a Trump supporter, you know? It's not that story at all. But I do think that there is something about, there was, there, there, as, as the years wore on, and especially after January 6th, there was this line between freedom and criminality yeah. that for many people, many white people specifically, there was a, there's like a real confusion about what is freedom and what is, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> what's criminal for me is not criminal for maybe mm -hmm. someone else, right? And that this sense of, um, how the law intervenes is not, um, it is not, it's not fair. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing, there's nothing universal about the view on legality, right? Or on the law. And so the play of Antigone, I feel like there's something that's so interesting about the fact that that play is about privileged people and it is about this like what happens when the law doesn't have to apply to you? Mm -hmm. Do you know, like at some point, Creon's like, let her go. Let's just like pretend we didn't see. Mm -hmm. And she says, no, 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 see me, see that I did this. See mm -hmm. I crossed the line. And I think that that was something that uh, over the years, I think became much more a theme in the work that we were doing and I think in terms of doing classics, I don't know if we weren't putting it against Antigone, if it would have been so clear mm -hmm. in your and Rafe's story at all. Like, I don't think that that, mm -hmm. Rafe is Annie's brother, who, who is the other character in the play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely like what you were saying, Shay, about like if we, if we hadn't had that as a container to sort of like push against or hold, hold things up against kind of thing. We're using it in a similar way. Like we'll have this as a scaffold for what we're trying to mm -hmm. explore. Um, and to have it there as like a sort of reliable and recognizable structure that yeah. we could then do a lot of ab sorry, abstraction and experimentation with, you know. Um, but yeah, the first conversation that I remember was Becca had just read Bonnie's book, <laughs> um, Antigone Interrupted, and we were just having a conversation about what we might make together, and she said, I've just read this book about, I, or I think you said, like, I'm really interested in classics, actually, mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. or always, um, <laughs> and I'm really interested in classics, I've just read this book about Antigone, what do you want to do, <laughs> I said, um, I think I might want to make a solo, and um, and I'm really interested in in sound, like and live experimentation with sound, and that was sort of where we. St oh, and I said, and then when you said, you know, I ha I just read this book about Antigone, and it's about how Antigone has. In what I remember was you said it, how Antigone has influenced like jurisprudence and legal decision making and um, uh, ideas of right and wrong and legal and illegal and where those intersect and where they don't. And I remember saying like, what has always struck me or interested me in like my haunting that you described, which is very uh, relatable mm -hmm. um, for me, is um, the, that I said, and I said this to you, I think in the first conversation, which was, I've always wondered what it would be like to believe in yourself that much, you know, to really be like, I am, what, and what would it feel like as a performer? I perform in my show, also. I don't know if I said yeah. that in the what's important part. Um, but uh, yeah, what would it feel like as a performer to, to do that, to embody a person who's like, this is, I'm right, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm doing what I'm doing to the point of obliteration. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, like, I wonder, would it be real? Like, if you did that as a performer, would you feel that? Or would you feel like a little bit of this is a performance or, a, or, a, mm -hmm. or like a dare, you mm -hmm. know, or something? Like, what's yeah. inside of there? And, like, I was struck by when you said I, I ended up performing in the show 
even though that wasn't the plan. And I've had that experience with several pieces of work. And it's like, for me, it's like some things can only be made from the inside out. Yeah. There's no other door, you know? That's real. Mm -hmm. The door opens from the inside <laughs> and that's it. And it, this piece of work was like that for me also. Mm. Um, and so, so that was one thing is like, what, what is that perfect state of self-belief and is it real? And would it feel real to perform that? And what, you know, that's like a, yeah, I wanted to know what it would be like. And then, so I said that. And then the other thing I said was like, the other piece of the story that interests me much more than the like truth to power thing that is, you know, often very large in productions of Antigone or the, or the, um, yeah. or the other components of the story was about this having a brother that you feel like you are obligated to rescue a criminal brother who you feel like you're obligated to rescue, mm -hmm. and also a criminal brother who you have a societal and familial expectation to rescue, <laughs> um, which is a dynamic in my personal life with my, oh, my only sibling. So we sort of eliminated all the siblings besides that one, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we just dealt with that, you know, this kind of brother, sister, older, um, in my case, like older sister, younger brother dynamic um, mm -hmm. with this component of, um, criminality and the law and, and um, whose responsibility is it to, mm. to save or rescue or, you know, because I was like, I relate to that. I, I th and then we had these conversations about like, and I think in classics, people who, many people here know a lot more about classics than I do, but like in the Antigone, it seems like there's these discussions of like, does she do this burying out of personal need or familial obligation or piety or all of these things. And I was just like, I, I get it, I get it. I get mm. feeling like I have, I am responsible for that person. Mm -hmm. I have to save them even though they're dead, you know? I have to, that is my job. And the struggle of that, you know, the, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. So that was our first, conversation about yeah. it and then we started yeah yeah and Rachel I'm, I'm wondering you might have some thoughts in response maybe <laughs> maybe a lot of thoughts in response to that but I, I'm wondering about the this idea of Antigone or the classics as a container and how you filter that in your teaching how you look at language the lang the original language the interventions into the original language i mean there's so many ways to i oh, there's so many ways to work on this material and it feels like whenever i'm in space with people who are devising with the classics in particular i feel like oh this is the way actually to begin to understand what these are about because the works themselves at least for me how i receive them actually what they are they're adaptations these plays yeah. as they exist like these they're from these received histories of of literal vocal storytelling some of which have survived on papyrus wow you know and like they're from these plays that were um are a very specific articulation of an event that is like existing at was existing at one point in living memory so that is an adaptation already yeah. and there's like this i feel like there's this um even aesthetically with how sometimes we engage with this work that there's this way to do it correctly and the more i'm in spaces where the correct way is actually like a deconstruction or it's a trying to understand what are the pieces that hold the pe what are the pieces that hold this story together and in fact why why is collaboration necessary why are audience necessary these pieces feel so civic in nature i think that's actually why they're still important to do mm -hmm, yeah. is because they require a conversation with a body on the outside and so it's like the activity of reading them is it's like it's you're witnessing adaptation and putting them up no matter what you do mm. is an adaptation of something and so i'm receiving so much and hearing you saying you you know you read this piece and there was a haunting and it's like whoa i i i feel like these engaging with these plays are like they're like speech acts you start speaking this language mm. and sometimes it's so, like some of it is so old yes. that it just the the fact that you're speaking it out loud is an event mm. for me like it's yeah. actually it's mm -hmm. extraordinary yeah. and um i one of my personal like favorite memories is performing in this um 
production of an Iliad, which is this one person show of all of the books of the Iliad, <laughs> which is outrageous. Um, but the beginning of the show starts with a single person on stage speaking Greek and to, like speaking ancient Greek, speaking the beginning of this poem and that like be holding space for that level of connection. You talk about ancestry, yeah. the fact that all of us can have access to something that is shared history because there were witnesses. So like that we all get to own a version, some version of how those stories continue to reverberate, exchange and have space for other vantage points um, and existences and identities is like, the thing, mm. it's yeah. the work. So that's what I hear in yes. just um, engaging with you and hearing how you're all working on this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that resonates so much, so, so much, like everything y'all are saying. Like the, I've been doing a lot of thinking around performance art and artistic practice outside of the mm -hmm. Western European realm of like how it's used as like cultural rooting and cultural grounding. So when you share that, I'm thinking like, I mean, in, my, in Antigone, we're hearing from ancestors. Mm -hmm. Like there's these pieces of work that have transcended time are also ancestors are speaking mm -hmm. to us. And mm -hmm. for some reason, like you were saying, this was a moment where we needed to revisit that. Yeah. you know yeah. and in that piece to call in those voices and be like what do we have to learn because like a lot was built back before yeah. mm -hmm. people have gone through these moments of like difficulty tragedy they yeah. documented it yeah. i think the orality piece that you mentioned strikes a chord because it's like oh that makes so much more sense now why this yeah. piece mm -hmm. was a haunting because mm -hmm. it was meant to be shared and it was public and it was you know it was a whole other way of practicing creative you know creative narrative, creative embodiment. Mm. And this piece of like the transgenerational trauma mm. is like so important because like you were mentioning also, we were having all these conversations politically, the hardest conversations were with our family members, yeah. with our loved yeah. ones, mm. you know? Yeah. And what, how did we hold space for those conversations? Mm -hmm. And this piece, Antigone in particular, I feel speaks to that, something that I, in, in my version, I rescued Ismene, because I just, we were talking about that. I could not let it go. This is a lie. If I had a sibling that was like Ismene, she would not just bounce and I would be like, whatever, on my own. She would be on my ass, you know? And so like in this story, it's really Antigona and Ismene wrestling through grief, through anger, through like, I love you so much and how could you not understand me? Like, how do you have this such a separate mm. understanding of what you need to do for our family mm. than what I think, you know? And like, like literally, I feel like I cried several times in that play because of that. Like, mm. Ismene, you know, you're like navigating deep stuff with a sibling. Some of the hardest moments in life, mm. folks who have siblings, mm -hmm. like, that can be some brutal conversations because yeah. you know each other so well. Or you also want this person to like, you want this connection to exist in a way that, I mean, you're still separate people, mm -hmm. but you do feel this responsibility. And with Antigona in, partic in, partic blah, blah, in particular, mm -hmm. language, <laughs> eh, con Antigona in particular. <laughs> claro que sí, huepa. <laughs> con Antigona, I feel like this fascination with the brother with mm. the brothers, mm. but specifically the brother who was not buried, mm. was this desperation to save their family, mm -hmm. to like save the sacred. It's like Antigone mm. didn't even want to be political. Like a lot of people politicize Antigone. They just cared about their family. They just wanted their brother to get buried. Mm. They wanted to honor the sacred and the land. Just also at the end of the story, the fact that Cre like they are killed and Cre they they're basically, you know, buried alive in the mountain. Like I'm yeah. from a mountain in Puerto Rico, like they're going, they're being forced to go back yeah. to the land in a way. Like mm -hmm. there's so much deep there. And I saw Antigone in particular as a sentinel of the sacred. Like there's a lot of sacredness. You know, we can't have political conversations without acknowledging mm. that we are spirits. Like we are human, we're here, things affect us. Mm. You know, all these politics, they're not here. They're like in here, mm -hmm. you know? so. 
the private and the public in a way like becomes like the spiritual and the personal with the rest of the world, how we engage with our kin, with their environment. So there was so much there. I feel like I was in love with this piece. I wanted to destroy it and wrestle with it. And that's, you know, that's what we all do, I guess, with Antigone. It's so interesting the way, like, using the word wrestling. Like, mm. I feel like that, like, there's literal wrestling in our show. <laughs> yeah, I know. I beat that. And, I, <laughs> and it's like, it's right that there's this, and I don't yeah. know if, I mean, I don't know the Trojan women. That, that's where, after the sack of Troy. Mm -hmm. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like that has, I mean, I guess I just wonder about this, like, if there is something in it that's like, because I feel like that's reading Bonnie's book, one of the big things for me was like argument. We work through argument. Mm -hmm. Like people, sometimes new collaborators will come in, they're like, I, like, is everything okay with that But that's how we work. That mm -hmm. Conflict is actually part of our, mm -hmm. the nature of how we move forward, and we wouldn't be able to make if we couldn't disagree, you know what I mean? Mm. And um, and then reading Bonnie's book, the, you know, there's the way, the way I understood this concept of agonism, the idea that like, it's anti-democratic actually in a way to want to agree all the time, you know, because if you, yes. if you have to agree, then you're never gonna find something yeah. else mm -hmm. together. Yeah. And that is like, relationships with no conflict have no intimacy. Yeah. yeah. You know, so like, that, and I think that's true of collaborative relationships mm -hmm. and familial relationships. And something I was thinking about when you were speaking, Shay, about that we talk about a lot in the show is like, there's a feral, like primalness mm -hmm. in the vocabulary, <laughs> um, physical vocabulary in particular. And like a lot of our research, and so, to also to talk a little bit about the devising work, it's like we had, Becca and I had that conversation, then we basically started like bringing ingredients. You know, we brought like a bunch, how many translations of Antigone can we find? And then yeah. we had my autobiographical. <laughs> and then, and then we interviewed a lot of people about their siblings, you know, and something that we found was like many people, their most intense experiences of physical violence, for example, are with their sibling. Mm. Um, and we started to think about, like, it's not true for everyone, some people grow up to have a lot of violence in their life, but a lot of people that we talked with, their most intense experiences of like physical violence or just physical, just like mm. stuff, you know, was like with their sibling. And this idea of like the people that are little when you are little and yeah. you're where you live are this reminder of a self that we would prefer to forget a lot of the time, you know? Like, that sibling is a person, they are a physical embodiment of a, a person that you were mm. before your, my, <laughs> before my sophisticated, civilized, individuated self was formed, you know? Mm -hmm. So I can go around the world, like, pretending to be a grown-up, sophisticated, civilized person, but there is a person out there that is like, you threw me down the stairs for a bag of jelly beans. Mm. <laughs> that was you. You threw me down the stairs. You would, you know? Or like you buried me in a hole in the woods, or you like wrapped an extension cord around. I mean, this is like, this These is part of our yeah. show. We interview people, yeah. and it's wild. We interview people before the show about their sibling, <laughs> and most people, their first story, like the actor, Jesse, the other actor in the show, will be like, you got any brothers and sisters? And people will say whatever, and then he's like, oh, do you have any, like, stories about your siblings? And the first thing that comes out is, like, the craziest thing you've ever <laughs> heard, like, mm. about, um, about a primal self, mm. you know? And so the ancestry that you were talking about, Rachel, mm. and the sort of, the, the oldness, the ancientness of these stories was really interesting to us and how that can have a parallel with, like, the origin mythology of childhood, and um, and in our show, the imagery of the Wild West, which is which is very, that is the another part of it that is about my personal ancestry, about like frontiersness in California, um, and the West, and then the West, you know, of the mm -hmm. Antigone story, mm -hmm. the bigger West. It also feels like that primal part is like a really activating part of 
the piece, like that, that mm. play that there's this like constant dichotomy between order structure and like what the rules are mm. and how they exist in complete opposition with the thing that makes you superhuman. Mm -hmm. That other like primal thing that like is actually going to ignite when the law is telling you to operate in a way that is completely outside mm -hmm. of what you understand to be personhood, morality, mm -hmm. and family, and all of those things. Yeah. But somehow you have to you have to square with it in order to keep peace and keep order, even though there's like clear body disorder. <laughs> yeah. um, and it, I feel like that that primal thing you're talking about is like so central to Antigone's like <gasps> qualm, middleness, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. or with self. Um, yeah. Yeah, that mm. war with self. Mm. I think that was the whole premise of what I used to like reimagine. I feel like I had a lot of conversations with folks that were either independent artists or just like people that are bridges in some way mm -hmm. between institutionality or like radical space or like people who are trying to transform things, mm. whether they work in government or wherever. Mm. And like that holding of so much mm. and you know, the war of the self represented in Antigona and Ismene is like as two people who have built systems to preserve themselves. And like at some point they shatter, you know? There's this line, yeah. like at this point, my partner and I say this line all the time, life is hard, it's just that way. Mm -hmm. And Ismene says that to Antigona mm -hmm. and Antigona just rages like, <laughs> no way, it's not like this, we're gonna change it, you wow. know? But this idea of like also Ismen is showing how she has built systems for herself to hold this moment. Mm -hmm. And she believes this is the way that we gotta do it. And I have to save actually Antigona from themselves mm -hmm. because Antigona is ready to get out the war. Yeah. But Antigona is gonna go to war to restore the spiritual order, you know? So what does that mean? And in a way I had to, when I was writing it, I really didn't wanna have Antigona die. I was like, I'm not gonna let them die. But then at some point I had to make peace with myself, like they do have to die mm. in order for like some kind of order to be restored. And then Ismene can break their shell too because in a way they loved mm. each other and were in conflict. And it's really sad and terrible, but like their separation allowed them for them to achieve what they wanted in their fullest. And then Ismene takes on the lead as mm. leading a whole new level of governance in the island and like there's something about the labor of like women and non-binary people mm -hmm. because so i decided specifically that this play would not have um men and tiresias is a non-binary person in the play and creon comes in as just like a video projection and the two brothers are the shadows of the roosters and then just images mm -hmm. but like how we end up kind of like doing so much labor to unpack patriarchy <laughs> like it's still a, also a haunting yeah. like even if it's not in the space it's still in the space which yeah. the dead brother is like a reminder of that mm -hmm. like oh y'all made a big mess now <laughs> we need to <laughs> clean this up <laughs> damn yeah wow wow <laughs> we could end on that note <laughs> um but i'm i'm really conscious and grateful for all of you to be here. And I, I hope this conversation has helped um, you all to think about the many, many ways into these classical texts. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for you all sharing just a little window in, into that. I'm sure there's much more to say and to share, and I hope we will all continue to share. Um, but for me, that's the power of the classics, right? That, that every generation can reinterpret it, every person can reinterpret it, um, and whatever it is, right? However you wanna define the, the classics or a classical work, um, there, there are ways in, um, there's possibility for deconstruction there's possibility for reimagining. Mm. Um, and that's all debatable, of course, <laughs> and we can continue that debate and we will continue that debate. Uh, but maybe we'll pause there and take a moment. It's been an incredible evening. Um, thank you all for, for being here with us. Um, so we'll take a moment, we'll stop recording and then we'll go have some, some dessert to <laughs> get us into the night. Thank you. Right. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.